from heaven, having all sweetness within it. Let us pray, O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption, who live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, the true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, a virgin and mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints.
12th and final Eucharist Lecture Series presentation in celebration of our Archdiocesan Year of the Eucharist. My name is Jordan Haddad. I'm the Director of Lay Ministry Programs and Associate Professor of Dogmatic Theology here at Notre Dame Seminary. Although we just sat in the presence of the Lord, let us um, prepare for our presentation tonight by invoking the blessing of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us remember that we are still in the holy presence of God. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the giver of all good things, the source of every blessing and grace. We entrust this day, this Advent, and the conclusion of this year to you. And we ask that you would increase in us our desire to know, love, and serve you. Stretch our minds to know you and our hearts to love you. And may we never tire of seeking your face. Be with Archbishop Hughes tonight and bless his presentation so that we might together run to you as you seek us out. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our presenter for our final Eucharist Lecture Series presentation is Archbishop Alfred Hughes. Archbishop Hughes is originally from Boston, Massachusetts, and was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Boston in 1957. After serving in two parishes, he earned his doctorate in spiritual theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome and then served as professor, spiritual director, and rector at St. John's Seminary in Boston. Pope St. John Paul II appointed him as Auxiliary Bishop of Boston in 1981, Bishop of Baton Rouge in 1993, and finally Archbishop of New Orleans in 2002. Since handing over his Episcopal seat of our local church to Archbishop Amen in 2009, Archbishop Hughes has served as adjunct professor and adjunct spiritual director in residence here at the seminary. And recently, he's had a, a new book published with Ignatius Press. And by recently, I mean a couple weeks ago, <laughs> entitled Priests in Love with God and Eager to Witness to the Gospel, which would make an excellent Christmas gift for your pastor or any other priest you might know. Archbishop's presentation tonight is entitled the Eucharist and the future of the church. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you very much, Jordan. Uh, and thanks to all of you who have ventured out during this busy Advent season to participate this evening. I understand that uh, there are more of you participating via live stream than those that are actually here in the Schulte Auditorium. So we welcome all. And when Jordan presented to me the possibility of making this presentation and suggested the Eucharist and the future of the church, I said to him, I'm no predictor of the future. And then the more I pondered that title, the more I came to appreciate every Eucharist points to the future, and the church of the future will not be 
the church that Christ founded without the Eucharist. Can we break that open tonight? You have an outline that I hope will help you follow along. We'll aim for a presentation to end about quarter to seven and then provide an opportunity for any <clears throat> questions, observations that you might have. Let me begin by calling to mind a, a magnificent antiphon text from the uh, liturgy of ours for the solemnity of Corpus Christi, the sol solemnity of the body and blood of Christ. I don't know whether you know the history. Pope Urban IV in 1264 wanted to establish this feast, and he turned to both Saint, the future St. Bonaventure and to Thomas Aquinas and asked them to present drafts of uh, a text that might be used both for the liturgy of the Eucharist and for the liturgy of ours for that feast. When Bonaventure saw the text that Thomas Aquinas had drafted, he tore up his own and urged Urban IV to accept Thomas's rendition. And the antiphon for the Magnificat is a remarkable synthesis of what the Eucharist is. This is how it is rendered in English. O sacred banquet in which Christ is consumed, the memory of his passion is made present, past, made present. The soul is now filled with grace, present, active, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. When I was in the seminary, after the noon and supper meal, the whole community made a very brief visit to the chapel, to the Blessed Sacrament, and prayed together that antiphon. O sacred banquet in which Christ is consumed, the memory of the passion is made present. Grace is offered to those who receive, and a pledge of future glory given. Can we look now more specifically at how that is expressed, and therefore how we can experience it in the Eucharist? For the Eucharist is the mystery of faith, the redemptive mystery. All of the events of Christ's life we often refer to as mysteries in a, using a lowercase m, but the one mystery of faith with the capital M encompasses the whole life, passion, death, resurrection, ascension of the Lord, the redemptive life, death, and resurrection. It is that that we call the mystery of our redemption. I th I'm sure you are aware that after the celebrant pronounces the sacred words in the name of Christ that transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, he invites everybody participating to pronounce, to proclaim 
the mystery of faith. The redemptive mystery made present. And we have various acclamations that we then can enter into that profess that three-dimensional uh, uh, mystery of faith. What happened in the past, what's happening now, what is promised for the future. Let's look first at the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the word helps us to appreciate how God's revelation expresses his presence his, and his activity over history. We call it salvation history. The dimension of human history that unfolds God's plan for salvation. So the liturgy of the word offers us a perspective on salvation history. The liturgy of the word also is living and active as it's being pronounced, proclaimed during the liturgy. You know, we use the term inspired word for the sacred word of the Bible. We don't mean by using the term inspired word that that only applies, it does apply, but it doesn't only apply to the inspiration that the Holy Spirit gave to the human authors to ensure that what they were writing was going to proclaim authentic revelation from God. But we also are saying when we proclaim the word to be inspired, that every time we pick up that word and pray over it, every time we hear that word proclaimed and try to absorb it, the Holy Spirit is active. You know, there's a passage in the fourth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews that expresses this powerfully. The word of God is alive. It's like a two-edged sword penetrating the human heart, separating marrow from bone to unfold God's message. Pope Benedict the 16th called a, a synod of bishops that was focused explicitly on the word of God. And in his apostolic constitution, of apostolic exhortation at the end of the synod, called Verbum Domini, the word of the Lord, published in 2010, he urged that priests and bishops and deacons help more and more people to enter into a prayerful engagement with the word of God using what is usually termed in the, in the church, Lexio Divina, holy reading. Pope Francis established a Sunday specifically every year for the celebrant and homilist to preach on how to pray over and hear God's word personally, interiorly, and in a transforming way. The third Sunday of ordinary time in every liturgical year now, we've had two already, 
next February will be the, the third, dedicated to that uh, word of God. It was in the, his apostolic letter entitled A Peruit Elis. He appeared to them. Those are the words that St. Luke uses at the end of the Emmaus journey after Jesus in so many ways breaking open the scriptures and, and then celebrating probably the first Eucharist after the Last Supper appeared to them, revealed to them who he really was. We go the Carthusian who is a, a um, 12th century Carthusian abbot, um, wrote a, probably the classical text on how to do Lexio Divina. And he compares it to how we consume food. When we consume food, first, we ingest the food. And he urges those that he's writing to pick up the scriptural text or pick up the scriptural, the liturgical text. Remember, all liturgical texts are formulated from scriptural and patristic texts. So pick up the text, read it slowly, consciously allowing the words to be spoken by God to you. He calls that ingesting the food. Secondly, he says, we chew the food. That's meditating on the text. That's trying to draw out the deeper meaning of the text. That's trying to appreciate not just what is obviously and literally being said here, but what spiritually is being expressed. And then he talks about digesting the food letting it move from mind to heart and elicit from within the heart a response, a response to God, expressed response, so that we're not just intellectually trying to understand, but we're letting what has been understood a little bit more permeate the deeper recesses of the soul that the Bible calls the heart, not the biblical, not the physical organ, but the deepest resource recesses of the human soul. And finally, he speaks of savoring the food dwelling with what has happened, letting it prime the pump for the way we're going to live, following our prayerful engagement with the Word of God, so that we not just be hearers, but doers of the Word. Now notice when we talk about hearing God's word. We're not talking about hearing voices. We're talking about seeking insight. Letting the deeper meaning enter into the mind and then seep down and enter the heart. Another way of looking at this is to look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There are numbers 115 to 119 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. 
summarizes the meanings of sacred scripture. And the catechism indicates that, first of all, there is a literal meaning to every text in sacred scripture. And by the way, if you want to be assured of uh, uh, interpreting the literal sense accurately, I encourage you to think in terms of getting the, the annotated New Catholic uh, Bible. The annotated Bible has all kinds of footnotes that can clarify issues that, that you may wonder about, uh, wanting to be sure that you're rooting your understanding authentically in what the scripture means and how the church interprets it. And then the catechism goes on to say, besides the literal sense, but rooted in the literal sense, there are spiritual senses. There's a spiritual sense that is called allegorical. I'm not, that's probably not a very helpful term but it's a term that was first used in the school of Alexandria in the second century. Um, it doesn't mean metaphorical. Allegorical means recognizing that in many passages of scripture, there's a relationship between something that has been previously foreshadowed that then gradually unfolds and in Christ Jesus is fully revealed. That's what is meant by the allegorical. So it's really tapping that salvation history, the way in which revelation has gradually been unfolded up until the appearance of the Son of God. We all know that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle, the last public designated witness by Christ to his teaching. The second spiritual sense that the catechism identifies is the moral sense. And by the moral sense, the catechism means the immediate application that it may have to life right now. What does this text say that touches what's going on in my life? Now, may I introduce right here something to be attentive to. When, when we pick up a text to ponder, to pray over, to try to hear what God is saying, we, we want to make sure that uh, when something begins to strike us, we pause, stay with it, let it seep in. Why is it jumping out? Why is this word, this phrase, this verse jumping out at me today, the chances are it's directly related to something going on in my life right now. And that's the moral sense, the immediate application. It's a spiritual sense. It goes beyond the literal sense but it has an immediate implication for living life right now. And then the third spiritual sense that the Catechism speaks of is another fancy word, anagogical. The Greek word anagoge means journey. 
and it's focusing on what is to unfold gradually in our lives here on earth, but only in the fullness in the life to come after death. The future that we were talking about at the very beginning. So the liturgy of the word has that threefold dimension. If we root our listening in the literal meaning, but open ourselves to what the Holy Spirit may be helping us to appreciate in looking to the past, seeing its implications for the today, expressing what we hope for for the future, that helps us to mine the depths of the liturgy of the word. And before leaving the liturgy of the word, I encourage you, particularly when you, when you come to mass, ask God for one word to take home. One word, now that word may be a phrase, maybe a whole verse, but ask him for one insight that can be life-giving and have immediate implication touching the way in which I'm grappling with something in life. The liturgy of the sacrament follows the liturgy of the word. And that's an opportunity for us more fully, more deeply, more completely to enter into the redemptive mystery that is made present in sacrament. Again, Pope Benedict XVI had a bishop's synod exclusively on the Eucharist just as he did on the word of God. And in his apostolic exhortation, sacramentum caritatis, he urges us to appreciate and live more fully the mystery of our redemption as a result of our participation in the Eucharist. I'm sure you recognize that uh, this is part of a series that uh, has marked a, a year dedicated to the Eucharist here in the Archdiocese of New Orleans. We also have in, in the B cycle of Sunday readings from the 17th to the 21st Sundays of the year, an unpacking of that extraordinary chapter in John's Gospel, chapter six, that, that, that teaches us about the Eucharist, the sacrament of the redemptive mystery. I don't know how anyone can take that chapter and pray over it and in any way come to the conclusion, Jesus did not intend to give us his actual body and blood to enable us to enter into redemption and to, in the future, be raised up to eternal life with him. Five times in that chapter, he repeats in different words that same message. And at the end, a number of people walk away 
And he has to turn to the disciples who are set aside or identified as candidates for apostleship. Will you also walk away? And then there's that nervous pause and then Simon Peter speaks up for the rest. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe that you are the son of the living God. What is it that the church needs to focus on going forward? There's a wonderful uh, uh, letter that uh, Cardinal Robert Sara wrote to the entire church August 15th, 2020 just before he was uh, uh, completing his tenure as uh, prefect of that congregation. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cardinal Sara, his, his books are very worth reading. He speaks from depth. But this particular letter that he sends out to the whole church is uh, entitled, Let Us Return to the Eucharist with Joy. And he unpacks in, in that brief letter what is at the heart of the Eucharist. Now notice, this letter is released while the pandemic is going on. But at a point when it was becoming more possible for people to gather in churches. Let us return to the Eucharist with joy. I presume that you're aware that uh, the bishops of the United States last month adopted a document on the Eucharist that is to undergird a Eucharistic revival for the United States. What has triggered this? Well, first of all, leakage in the church. How many people have walked away from the Eucharist without realizing what they have walked away from. We need to do a, a better job of breaking open the richness of what is the cent, not, not only the central mystery of our faith, it's the pivotal event in all human history that is made present in sacrament every time the Eucharist is celebrated. So, our first motivation is the leakage in the church. Second motivation, COVID-19 and its variants, which again has also uh, made it difficult for people to participate in person, and many have become accustomed to uh, participating virtually. Uh, we need to invite people to recognize, yes, if we're confined, that's a beautiful way of enabling us spiritually to enter in. But if we're not confined to home or hospital or nursing home or prison, 
nothing replaces in person engagement with the Lord Jesus and sacramental participation in communion. It is intended in participating in the Eucharist that having heard some new word in the liturgy of the word, some new insight, some new invitation, and entering into the sacramental representation of the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord as the gifts of bread and wine are transformed into his body and blood. And we're bringing to the Lord what's going on in our lives to offer with him to the Father his offering of himself for our redemption. We're invited to be co-redeemers, lowercase, cooperative with Christ in redemption, our own redemption and the redemption of others. And in communion, we want to make sure that we, we don't approach it in a routine way. When I was growing up, prior to Vatican II, um, priests worked overtime to encourage people to come to confession and then participate in the Eucharist, take Holy Communion. After Vatican II, the pendulum swing has led people to approach it in a routine way and even in an unworthy way. Feel entitlement, but not realize the truth of what St. Paul said. If we partake of the body and blood unworthily, we condemn ourselves. It actually does more harm than good. So we also wanted to unfold the appropriate conditions for authentic, reverent, engaging, transforming, encounter with the Lord and Holy Communion, the kind of preparation we need to bring, the kind of life we need to be living, and the kind of grace that we're seeking in order to live out our encounter with the Lord. Now, this does not mean that we have to be saints in order to receive Holy Communion. Pope Francis has frequently said, Holy Communion is for sinners but not people who are living a life of sin and have no intention of addressing it. It's sinners wanting to be helped, wanting to be elevated, wanting to be healed, wanting to be changed, wanting to be drawn into a deeper relationship with him, wanting to hand over our lives a bit more fully today to him than we could do the last time we approached him. Might there be some future development of doctrine with regard to our understanding and our participation in the Eucharist, in this sense, what might the future hold? You know, when we 
participate in the Eucharist in the way in which we've just been talking about it, really allowing the Word of God to speak to us and elicit a desire to respond, participation in the sacrament of the redemption in the transformation of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of the Lord. As we move into that and then approach Holy Communion, we're engaging in a spousal union with the Lord. Remember now, Christ, one of the fundamental images of Christ's relationship with the church found in the scriptures is that he is the bridegroom to the church, his spouse. Now, is the church, of course, in common, but it's also the church personally. Can we break open the, the deeper appreciation of what it means to be called into a, a spousal relationship with the Lord? Now, as a man, it seems strange to use that terminology, and yet the scriptures use that terminology. And the book of the Song of Songs anticipates what's made possible in the Eucharist in a mystical way in, in the Song of Songs. You know, Pope John Paul II broke open the liturgy, the uh, theology and spirituality of the body. And it seems to me that building on the rich teaching that has profound implications for the way in which we experience our bodies, experience the union between body and soul, the way in which chaste life and love frees us to move into a, a deeper relationship with the Lord? Might there be a, a breaking open further of how the experience in Holy Communion provides an interpenetration of Christ with us personally and communally as we come about it together. Pope Francis, when he meets with married couples in the, uh, he often gives this very simple little message. He, he tells them, uh, uh, these are recently married couples that, uh, that come for a special blessing at the public audience. He tells them there are three important words to live out in your marriage if you want to know the richness of married life. First, I'm sorry. Second, please. And the third, Thank you. Now notice how that corresponds to the Eucharist. We begin the Mass expressing sorrow for our sins. And then 
we come to him, please speak a word. A word that will give me life, that will shed life on the life you've called me to live. And then, can I make a return gift for the gift you give to me of yourself in thanksgiving? The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. I'm going to conclude with uh, a little teaser. Um, something that I've pondered a bit and prayed about. You know, there's no record in the scriptures about uh, Jesus re revealing himself after the resurrection to his mother. Now, pious tradition, with a small t, is that he, that was probably so personal and so unique, it, it was not intended for public revelation. It, it had to happen. But we don't know. We don't know. What if what if the Lord wanted his mother, who he had now given as mother for all disciples, to experience him, the risen Lord, in Holy Communion, the same way all other disciples would be doing for the rest of time, what if that's what he wanted? And how does that invite us to enter into what must have been Mary's approach to meeting the Lord in Holy Communion? There's a church back home in Boston that's uh, a beautiful, uh, frescoes and one of the frescoes over the altar is a fresco of St. John offering Holy Communion to Mary. I've never seen it any place else but it's a powerful image of uh, the invitation to ponder and unite ourselves with Mary in approaching Holy Communion and wanting to experience the fullness of the victory over sin and death that her son won. And let the fullness of that grace enter in and transform and free and ennoble and break open what ultimately is going to be what God offers us in the life to come. So with that, I will conclude and uh, open up the possibility of uh, comments, questions, objections, difficulties, insights. Please, would, would you like to use the microphone? Or it may be helpful for us all.
you're traveling in a foreign country and you maybe you've been there a while and you f want to go to Sunday or Saturday, you want to go to Mass. And you have no problem with attending a Mass and you pretty well can understand what's going on and you want to go to Communion. But there, there was no way to go to Confession before going to this particular Mass. Can you just say the uh, act of contrition? and uh, go have communion, go take communion? I'm not saying that you're in. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for raising that. Um, whenever we cannot at the moment access the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, we can make as perfect an act of contrition as we can with the intention of going to the sacrament of penance and reconciliation when we can and approach the Lord in Holy Communion. Okay. We went to Sweden a couple of years ago to buy a Volvo. By, by? Of, of an automobile. And I'd always wanted to go to Sweden because I'd always heard so many things about they didn't have religion. And we went to the who, church. Who is this? In Sweden. Oh, the Waldensians? Uh, or, or the Lutherans in Sweden? We went to, we were directed to a Catholic church. Oh. Standing room only. And I did manage to get a seat, but my husband was standing. And I wanted to go to communion so bad, and I just made the act of contrition. And I, you, you knew what was going on. You could follow everything. Sure. And, uh, it was a, and it was all in Swedish. <laughs> and it, I thought, why not? That was beautiful. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Please. I just want I just want to share that I was always excited every time I received the Eucharist and a broken piece and I know that either way if it's in the broken piece, uh, if it's in the whole host, that it's still Jesus. But I couldn't understand why I was so excited when I received the broken piece. And I pondered it a while. And finally it came to me through the spirit that when I received the broken piece, I was receiving Jesus in his brokenness as it was when he was taken down from the cross and placed in the arms of his mother. He was in his brokenness. And so the spirit led me to believe that. That's why I was so extra excited was because he was um, letting me know that he was sharing my brokenness so we were sharing our brokenness together. And especially when sometimes, like if I had a death in the family or feeling down or whatever, and I would receive the, he would come to me in that way. And it was like a reminder that he was in his brokenness also. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Oh, thank you. That's, that's beautiful. And, and obviously we know that even in a particle, the whole Christ, not just the crucified, but risen Lord is present. But what you're saying is in receiving a broken particle, you and 
experience that as a reminder of the crucifixion side. And that's very helpful. We, we often just move too quickly to the resurrection <laughs> without dwelling, contemplating, identifying, uniting ourselves with the crucified Lord. Thank you for sharing that. Please. You had mentioned there's a, um, a Bible that goes into a lot of explanations other than the New American Version. I'm sorry? You mentioned there's a Bible to get that goes explains the passages. Could you repeat that? Yes, that uh, the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. So there is a Bible. Uh, an annotated. Annotated, okay. I'm sorry? An annotated Bible? Oh, anna oh annotated Bible. Yeah, the, 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 there's, there's an edition available of the New Catholic Bible that is entitled the Annotated New Catholic Bible. And um, it's uh, a bit bigger than the Bible because it has a, a lot of footnotes. But the, the footnotes, uh, you can access them if you want, or you don't, have, you can just ignore them. But they do, the, the footnotes are very good for clarifying what often are questions that ordinary people experience when they pick up a text and, and are wondering what the meaning, what the literal meaning is. And we want to ground our spiritual understanding in the correct literal meaning. So that's what I suggested, uh, the annotated New Catholic Bible. I know it might be too soon, but do you anticipate at some point in the future we'll bring back the uh, blood of Christ in the Mass? That what? The blood of Christ in the Mass, taking the, uh, the, the blood of, drinking the blood of Christ in the Mass. The going back to that? Yes. I, I, I think it's too soon it's too yet, soon, yeah. but yes, we, we will go back to uh, participating under both species. Um, um, at this juncture, it's still uh, something we need to be cautious about because we don't, while we want to share the blood of Christ, we don't want to share COVID. I understand. I <laughs> Great. just want to ask. You. Great. Yes, we will. Please. Hi, Archbishop. That was so rich. Thank you so much. I would like to do some studying on the mural that you mentioned in the Boston Church um, to find out a little bit about the artist and why he or she depicted St. John giving communion to, to Mary. Um, do you happen to know the name of the church so I can get started on uh, that? St. Mary's Church in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Is, is the church. Now, I don't know whether it's accessible online, the, but uh, it's St. Mary's Church, Charlestown, Massachusetts. Well, it sounds like a unique depiction, so yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. Thanks. Great, great. You bet. Please. Uh, thank you. Um, so you kind of talked about um, like this preparation that's have been necessary to enter more, like, more fully into the sacrament. Um, what role do you think the extraordinary form has in like, kind of facilitating this engagement and this preparation? Um, the, the preparation or, you know, Pope Benedict XVI, I think, was very helpful in indicating that um, in expanding the, the use of the extraordinary rite, he 
he wanted to promote a mutual impact on the ordinary form and the extraordinary form from the other. In the extraordinary form, the sense of reverence, awe, sacredness that is often missing or not focused on enough in the ordinary form. And in the ordinary form, there's a far richer exposure to sacred scripture uh, since we've developed a two-year daily cycle of selections from scripture and a three-year Sunday cycle that was not present in the extraordinary form. There's just one cycle uh, for both daily and Sunday each year. So he, that was his hope that um, there would be a, 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 a mutual positive impact on each other from each of the forms. Thank you. Good. Looks like Pamela is coming to conclude or say I've been here long enough. Um, thank you, Archbishop, for, um, yeah. <laughs> thank you for rounding out this year-long lecture series. Um, thank you all for coming. For those of you who have been with us since January, I can't believe that we're finally at the last one. Um, so thank you all for coming and supporting this with us. Um, we're going to be taking a break from a lecture series in the spring, uh, but we will be back hopefully in the fall with something new and exciting. Um, so we hope you all will join us for that. Um, if you've registered for the lecture series before, we have your email address, and so we can reach out to you through that once we 